The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. It's Tuesday. We're here, we're back, and uh, we're gonna be with you live for the next two hours talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective and really looking at things hopefully from a fresh approach, right? Uh, we know that there are a lot of things going on in your lives, whether you're a parent, teacher, practitioner, or you're an individual who yourself are on the spectrum and that you need answers and resources and information in lots of different ways, right? So we hope that you'll participate by talking to us and letting us know the kinds of things that you need as well as the things you don't need, right? If we're covering things here that are not useful to you, I count on you to let me know and to say, hey, Shannon, you know, you're over here you're saying squirrel and we need you to be over here, right? Give me some, some direction. I, I work for you. <laughs> so, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, in any case, Emily is gonna cycle through some of the different ways that you can get in touch with us here, some of the different ways that you can participate in the conversation. I'll remind you that our homepage is autism-live.com. If you'll go there, you'll find that there are a lot of things to do there, including the blog, but, and you can sign up for our free newsletter, and that's really important. I want to encourage you to do that if you haven't already, and get friends to sign up because we've got something in the works that's going to be big uh, that I think you're really going to enjoy that we'll have to do with the newsletter. But uh, also on that homepage, you see that there's a desktop, and on the desktop sits a computer, and on that computer, if you click on the little triangle that's there, you have the ability to watch the live show or the most recently recorded live show. And you can also cycle through, if you hit the playlist, you can cycle through and pick uh, any of the shows that you wanna watch, right? But to the side of that, there are a couple of white boxes. One that says Shannon is answering right now, which is hilarious because it's not usually me answering the question, <laughs> right? But then the box under that is your question. Put your cursor there, start typing, hit enter, and it shows up here on my screen eventually. It takes a minute or two for it to fly through space, hit a satellite, be beamed over here, and then shoot down to here. So give it some time, but it does get here. Uh, in any case, it's free, and you don't have to log in. You don't give us any of your personal information. I'm very proud of that because I think it's important for you to have that option of maintaining anonymity, right? Um, but if you want us to get back to you directly, we were talking with Dr. Tarbox the other day about some of the studies that are available that might be useful to you going into an IEP discussion. If you want access to those studies and you want us to get them back to you, I have to have an address to email them to or a number to call you at to talk to you, whatever. You can put personal information in there and I won't share it with the folks at home. How's that? Uh, okay, so I want to remind you at the start of the show, like I always do, that uh, while we have lots of experts who are here on the show, I am not one of them. I am a parent and a former teacher. I will, I will admit to that, right? And proudly uh, admit to that, but uh, both on both counts. But my son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. We started ABA at the age of three and what a difference that made in our lives. So that's why I have a passion to be here to talk about all the things that we encounter in this community. I love to learn, have front row seat to do the learning with you and you guys teach me and we learn together when we have the experts here in the room. But do not be mistaken, uh, while I speak about some things that I know from my personal life, I am not an expert in autism. I'm, I, I work on being a good student of autism, right? But in any case, lots of things for us to talk about and I wanna get to them. We like to start every morning with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of 
of the day, the jargon du jour, where we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym, and we try to make sense of it in our world. First, we give you the actual definition because I, I'll be honest with you, it's very reinforcing for me to make fun of the jargon and <laughs> the definitions because they make no sense, the actual definitions, uh, especially not in the beginning. And then we move on to our working definition, which hopefully gives us a little bit more insight into what exactly we're talking about. And then we can figure out how does it fit into our everyday lives, right? Okay. <clears throat> So today's term, it's the first time we've used it, but I've been talking about it a lot lately. So uh, it is behavior momentum. And really, I think it's behavioral momentum. Uh, my bad, because it's a newer term toward to me. All right, so let's take a look at what our actual definition is. And I ripped this right from Wikipedia, because if you're looking this up, if somebody says this in your meeting and you're looking it up, where do you go to find the answer? Behavior momentum is a theory in quantitative analysis of behavior. And it is a comparative metaphor based on physical momentum. It describes the general relation between resistance to change, persistence of behavior, and the rate of reinforcement obtained in a given situation. Hallelujah, amen. We can, like, this makes it crystal clear, clear right? We don't need to discuss this anymore. <clears throat> right? Uh, so what are we really talking about? For our working definition, behavioral momentum is a technique for increasing compliance. We talked about this a little bit last week. Compliance, we want compliance, right? What do you do when you're teaching something that's hard? What do you do, right? You have to, we've talked about this before, you have to find ways of making it worthwhile, right? But behavioral momentum is just one more thing that you can do to sort of ramp up, if you will, to a right answer. So if somebody says to you, okay, today, uh, let's say you get a really good teacher who's gonna teach you how to cliff dive. I brought up this example last week. I have no desire to cliff dive. I don't know why that's the example I keep bringing up. But you're gonna go cliff dive, right? And you bring the person to the edge of the and say, okay, jump? I don't think so. You have to build some confidence and let the person believe that they're making progress, right? So you start with something small and say, we're not gonna take on the big task, we're gonna do the small task first. So you have them jumping one foot. Yay, that's fabulous. Now we're gonna have you jump off of a plank one foot. Yay, that's fabulous. And the person's like, hey, I can do this. So now you have them jump off two feet, right? And eventually you get to the point where you have them jump off 30 feet before you take them to the cliff because you've built momentum. You've shown them, look, I can do things. And now look, I'm even doing the thing that was really hard. I'm jumping off the cliff. That's what behavioral momentum does. So let's take this into a real world situation, but not a child on the spectrum. Let's say that what you really want is for your husband to learn how to uh, press his own shirt, right? We're not gonna start with something that's as difficult as doing the cuffs and the collars, right? That's really kind of hard and takes a great deal of patience. And if he's going to start with that, what's the likelihood that something's going to go wrong and it's not, and I know there are some men out there who are expert ironers, but um, some that aren't, right? <laughs> so we would start with ironing maybe a handkerchief and showing how to plug in the iron and doing that and going, look, that's fabulous. What a great job that you did. Then next we're going to iron something that's a little bit harder, um, that has a corner that has to be, you know, gone around before we work up to doing the collar because by that point you know your husband's like wow this is easy this there's nothing big about this so when he gets to something that's a little more difficult he he's built some momentum we do this with our kids all the time too if we're going to ask the kids to do something that's really really difficult we're going to start with things that they already know how to do so they go hey i i'm you know i can do this i i'm capable of doing these things that's behavior momentum behavioral momentum helps us it increases the possibility that we're going to get compliance because we've set up a circuit. I, sometimes I say it's about getting the train on the track, right? We're not going to go over the trestle until we got the train on the track. Once we get the train on the track, it just kind of follows along. Uh, you say to the child, okay, say rabbit. And the child can say rabbit. It's been saying rabbit forever. And the child says rabbit. And you say, say dog. And the child says dog. And each time they're getting reinforcement, right? So when you get to say oscillating sprinkler, right? <laughs> right? They're going to give it their best try. Uh, they're, you know, because 
because the momentum is happening. They're going to say it. they may not get it exactly right, but they're going to come at it with a sense of confidence uh, to give it an, at least an attempt, and you're going to reward the approximation. Behavioral momentum, really fabulous. It's a technique for increasing compliance. All right. Very useful with our kids on the spectrum and with people in our lives. Okay, so moving on, we always have a question of the day for you. Our question of the day is already getting a lot of traction and tweets. We want to know what keeps getting in your way. We're going to really take some time and talk about this today. What's preventing you from being able to do something? What's preventing you from getting to the good stuff? What's preventing you from relaxing? What's preventing you? What, what keeps constantly? Is it paperwork that's getting in your way? You got to go to do something, but you don't have the paperwork done. Is it money? Not a lack of money. Let's, we're going to really dive into that, but see if you can name it, right? See if you can really look at it and go, what is getting in your way? I'm going to own up and say clutter is getting in my way. So it's time to do something about that. But what is it for you? Let's talk about it. Let's name it and then let's come up with a plan, right? Okay, we always have a topic of the week and our topic this week is, of course, because we're talking about what's getting in the way. So the next a logical thing is removing the obstacles. How do we remove the obstacles to get to the good stuff? How, instead of just having the same thing happening, I keep having the problem with clutter, so it's time to remove the clutter <gasps> take a breath right? <laughs> right or at least let's talk about behavioral momentum maybe I don't have to remove all the clutter because that makes my chest go ah uh. maybe I need to remove some clutter in one place so that I go look at how nice this is uh, guess who cleaned her car this weekend because at some point I have to get to the point where I can clean my office and then the garage, <laughs> heaven help me, right? I'm building behavioral momentum with myself so that I will be willing to take on the garage because I will see, I'm riding in my car going, whose car is this? Uh, I can't even believe it, right? <laughs> behavioral momentum. Let's remove those obstacles so we get to the good stuff. Life is short and it shouldn't be about some of the things that it's about, right? So let's name them. And then let's figure out ways to remove them and let's use behavioral momentum to do it. All right, some of the different things that we are going to talk about here today on the show. We are going to talk about those obstacles uh, and everybody's is different, right? But when you get right down to it, obstacles are there because for some reason they worked for a period of time, right? And now they're not working anymore. So let's let's uh we're gonna we're gonna go through and figure out how we can tie these things up and do them different uh we also have a guest who's going to be joining us in the second hour Sam Fleischner is going to be with us, and he is the director of a new film that's about to come out uh, that I had the privilege of being able to watch yesterday. It's called Stand Clear of the Opening Doors, and it, the one of the main characters is a teenager who is on the autism spectrum. It is a, a really interesting movie that I think you're all going to be interested in, and especially in light of the setting, because it takes place in New York City. And and it is a 13, 14 year old boy who comes up missing, who's on the autism spectrum and you take a journey with him. And especially in light of the Avante Aquendo story, it's particularly poignant. So we're gonna be talking with Sam, the director of that film, about some of the choices and some of the ways in which this involved, evolved and about the fact that the, the main character who is on the aut autism spectrum is actually on the autism spectrum. And, and what that was like directly directing this young man. I know I've got lots of questions. We also have a bunch of stories in the news that we're going to take some time to cover as well as your answers to the question of the day. We want to know what's getting in your way. All right. So all of that and ever so much more stick with us. We're going to be right back after these messages. Hi guys. Welcome back to Smarty. This month, we're going to be making a mandala. Mandala, you ask? What's that? Well, in Sanskrit, that means circle. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. Okay, the materials you'd be needing for this project are colored paper, scissors, and glue. I'm assuming a lot of you guys have made paper snowflakes before. Well, 
This is the same idea except for we're going to be doing it with A, lots of color, and then B, we're going to be layering it up. So first step we're going to have to do is fold a piece of paper so when we cut it out there's going to be a repeating pattern on it. So what you're going to do is fold it in half and then you're going to fold it in half again. Make sure your lines are super creased, okay? And you're going to keep doing this. You're going to keep folding it in half as many times as you can possibly fold your paper. So now that this is folded in half as many times as I physically can fold it, I'm going to take my scissors and I'm going to cut out the excess. So here's the paper with all the excess cut off. If I open it up, boom, it's a circle. But it's missing all the wonderful patterns in here that repeat. So let's fold it back up. And what we're going to do now is we're going to cut the shapes in it. Kind of like a snowflake. So get creative here. Remember, don't go all the way through or else you're going to just cut in half. So have fun with it. Okay, since my paper is, as you saw earlier, double-sided with different colors, I'm going to cut out the center part and I'm going to flip it. I know that sounds crazy, but you'll see what I mean in a second. Alright, so let's open this up and take a look at it. Ooh, so you see that? I've got a perfect circle with a repeating pattern. Exactly what I wanted. Alright, so I've cut out the center part that I cut out for my whole circle. Open it up. Look at that. It's another circle, but it's smaller. I'm going to take this and place this in the inside. So the basic idea of the mandala is you're going to take your construction paper, fold it like I just showed you, and then cut different sized triangles, which will turn into circles, so there'll be layers of colors with the pattern. And of course, while you're doing this, you can talk about colors and have them work on their cutting skills. So now that I've cut out several snowflakes, I am going to start gluing them down on a piece of paper. Here's my mandala. It looks pretty finished, and it can be. But if you have an older kid and you really, really want to phone in on working on pattern making, you can take this little scrap pieces that you cut out and have them add to the pattern themselves. Well, I hope you and your child enjoyed this project and learned a lot from it. Until next time, guys. Craft on. Can you see me flying by your side? Welcome back to Autism Live. I want to take just a couple of seconds to talk about some of the questions that you guys wrote in over the weekend. First one, hi Shannon, I wrote in about the skills. Does the level of the question correspond with the age? For example, one of the questions I'm getting is can your child identify the conflict from the perspective of each child involved? His age is right in the skills account because that was one of the questions that I had asked that parent, are you sure that your age is right? Uh, is my child just that behind it? Four, seems high skill for a four year old, thanks. Okay. Keep in mind that all of those things are when it begins to emerge, when it begins to emerge, not completed, right? So it's very possible that 99% of four-year-olds wouldn't have this skill under control, but maybe a certain percentage of them would begin to have that skill emerge, right? So so keep that in mind. It's at what point it, it begins to emerge. I use the example of that there are, there are lessons about being able to repair a conversation that begins to appear probably at age five, but I, I know 58-year-olds who are still working on that right that are not on the spectrum so so keep that in mind so you you always want to say okay that doesn't necessarily mean your child is behind uh, if it hasn't emerged but they're just saying that it has the potential to emerge there because what it usually means is that we need to start working on some of the precursors to that so don't worry about it overly much because remember you're not going to work on all the lessons you're going to prioritize which lessons are important to you right now and hopefully you've got somebody who's working with you who's a BCBA who can help you that's literally where the design of your child's program comes in is saying here's the priority here here we need the precursors to get to that what are we working on how are we mixing these eight different curriculums so that we get the right mix for each individual child because this is not a one-size-fits-all so hopefully you've got somebody who's helping you to design that but that would be why I agree with you that's a really I don't think that the average four-year-old would ever have that skill completed. But I think it's important to realize that the building blocks to that start as early as four, because uh, we don't want to set up a circumstance where we let your child get further behind, right? So the building blocks can be worked on in that way. 
Okay. Uh, and my Kipple wants to know, I will be looking for a BCBA program between four to six years from now. Uh, do you know a program in Wisconsin or online? I don't know of anything in Wisconsin because my experience with BCBA programs is rather limited, right? But I hear a lot of things. Uh, we had Tom Zabo on the other day from the Florida Institute of Technology. So I know that that is an online program that uh, is interesting. And the other one that I'll be honest with you, because there was a there were a couple of seconds when I was thinking about being a BCBA, and then I realized that life is short and I don't have that much time. <laughs> Uh, you know, I mean, it still is something in the back of my head, but, you know, I'm busy being a mom and raising a kid and doing this. So, uh, but the one that I was looking at, Mike, to be honest with you, was at Endicott College. They have, uh, I already had a, have a master's degree, but I don't have a master's in psychology. So uh, I was looking at getting that and they have, you can get a master's degree in autism. I used to joke about that, about, you know, I'm getting a master's degree in autism. Uh, but it turns out that there really is such a thing as a master's degree in autism. And while you're getting your master's degree in autism, you are doing your coursework for your BCBA. So at the end of the master's program, which I want to say is two years online and one in the summer, but don't quote me on that. I might be wrong, but Endicott College, you can look it up on their, their webpage. Um, but at the end of that time, I believe you get to sit for your board so that you're doing it all at the same time. It's kind of uh, amazing. And with some of the great, great minds, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Mike Dorsey, who runs that program. So <clears throat> in any case, um, it's one of my favorites, but there are so many others that are out there, Mike. And so I'm going to ask some of our experts when they're in the studio this week to, to give their recommendations. Okay. Is it a deal? Uh, and then the last one, uh, hi, thank you all for all you do. Where can I find the research for getting an aid for my son? I want to push for an inclusion model and I know it won't be easy. So please send me your email address and I will send you links to those research studies that Dr. Tarbox was talking about on Thursday. Uh, the ones that show, uh, what, what can be done in the classroom, what can be achieved. Those were the things that he was talking about. And if you're not, if you don't know what we're talking about, go back and watch Thursday when Dr. Tarbox was here because he was talking about just this and what are the research studies that show that. So uh, thank you for writing those questions in over the weekend. Keep those questions coming. We love to answer those. We're going to take a break and we're going to be back to talk about some things in the news. So stick with us. Hello activists, let's talk about step seven. Recognize your gifts and abilities. Whatever gifts and abilities you had before autism entered your life, you have them now. And I bet you've developed some that you didn't even know you had. Those gifts and abilities are gonna help you in your journey of parenting a child with autism spectrum disorders. Maybe you're a born researcher, teacher, negotiator, or organizer. Well, you're gonna need all of those talents and you could find a whole new calling. That's what happened to me. If you had told me 20 years ago that I was gonna leave behind a career as a television producer to work as an autism advocate and activist, I would have said, you're nuts. If you don't think you have any special gifts or abilities, ask someone who loves you. They'll tell you what they are. I guarantee you, you have them. What's your special gift? Find it, use it for yourself, for your child, for the good of all concerned. Until next time, keep the faith. Welcome back to Autism Live. You know, we talk a lot on the show about things that happen in the news, and from time to time, we like to give you updates on some of the latest research that's happening. And we do this for many different reasons, to keep you guys informed, but I also, I think it's important. There are a lot of people who get, for lack of a better word, fatutsed. Uh, there's a lot of money that needs to be spent in the field of autism. Some of it needs to be spent on research. I think we can all agree on that, right? Um, some of it needs to be on helping kids to get access to the care that they need. And, uh, you know, I, I it's hard to be able to decide who needs to do what. And I know people get very angry with organizations who don't do it all. And no one can, right? But I, I want you to know that research is, is important to our community, in my opinion, and that it isn't just 
important to our community. And this is one of the reasons why our uh, legislators and our government needs to be willing to spend more money on research for autism, because it has benefits for other things as well. And that's what this first story uh, relates to. There is a new study that has shown that an autism-related protein could play a vital role in addiction. Okay, in a paper published in the latest issue of neuroscience journal Neuron, McLean Hospital investigators report that a gene essential for normal brain development and previously linked to autism spectrum disorders also plays a critical role in addiction-related behaviors. Very interesting. So uh, Christopher Cowan, who is a PhD, the director of the Integrated Neurobiolog Neurobiology Laboratory at McLean and an associate professor of psychology psychiatry at Harvard Medical says that chronic exposure to drugs of abuse cause changes in the brain that could underlie the transition from casual drug use to addiction. By discovering the brain molecules that control the development of drug addiction, we hope to identify new treatment approaches. Uh, they used animal models to show that the fragile X mental retardation protein, or FMRP, plays a critical role in the development of addiction-related behaviors. FMRP is also the protein that is missing in fragile X syndrome, the leading single gene cause of autism and intellectual disability. Uh, the team found that cocaine utilizes FMRP to facilitate brain changes involved in addiction-related behaviors. Uh, FMRP controls the remodeling and strength of connections in the brain during normal development. Their current findings reveal that FMRP plays a critical role in the changes in the brain connections that occur following repeated cocaine exposure. So he goes on to say that we know that experiences are able to modify the brain in important ways. Some of these brain changes help us by allowing us to learn and remember. Other changes are harmful, such as those that occur in individuals struggling with brain abuse. While MF, excuse me, FMRP allows individuals to learn and remember things in their environment properly, it also controls how the brain responds to cocaine and ends up strengthening drug behaviors. By better understanding FMRP's role in this process, we may someday be able to suggest effective therapeutic options to prevent or reverse these changes. And again, that is coming to us from Christopher Cohen, who is a PhD uh, and is the director of Integrated Neurobi Neurobiology Laboratory at McLean and an associate producer of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. What I love about this is that the research on Fragile X is helping to deal with addiction. And in turn, this look at addiction may help us to be able to do something that changes the brain chemistry for autism. Lovely, right? When these things are working together, when you find answers, you find more questions and more answers. I absolutely am excited about that. Uh, now, another story, story that was in the news, which greatly saddened me, and I think that a lot of us can relate to this on some level, that uh, there are parents that are uh, claiming that a Tribeca preschool rescinded their son's admission after their autism diagnosis. Uh, the parents are understandably very upset about this. Uh, it is Jennifer Sample and Elliot Ferguson. They are Soho parents who were sending their child to the Washington Market School in Tribeca, a very posh, uh, uh, as I understand it, expensive school. Uh, and the child was accepted, got one of the last spots at a place that's very difficult to get into. And once the child was, it was disclosed that the child had been diagnosed with autism. And remember, this is a preschool. He's not even three years old yet and was recently diagnosed with autism. And the enrollment director, Rachel Mashesi, uh, informed the mom that the boy, in quotations, would not be a good fit and they rescinded his uh, accept, his acceptance to this preschool. And the parents are suing. Uh, I think one of the things that's particularly hard uh, to understand is that they did it on, uh, it was either the day of or the day after Temple Grandin had visited the school. 
Uh, I, I know so many of you have written in and shared that you have stories like this where your child didn't get into a school or got into the school and once they told you, once you told them, excuse me, that the child had autism, suddenly it didn't fit anymore. And of course the school or whatever the entity is will frequently say, oh, it has nothing to do with the autism. but. The fact remains that the child was accepted before, and I myself have heard this, well, it just won't be a good fit. Uh, it's discrimination. It's not allowed. They're suing. I support them in this. Um, we need to move the dial, right? Uh, really, really disappointing. And I feel so particularly bad for these parents uh, because in that moment, it's that bit of reality, right, that shows up because you think, okay, I've gotten the diagnosis, we're going to do what we have to do, we're, we're going to participate in the way we have to participate. And the mom even says in this article that, you know, she would be honest and say if she didn't think that her child could fit there, but an expert in the field has said that inclusion is the best model for her child, and I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that for a second, and yet the school doesn't see it. Now, I, I say to all of us, we, you know, it's good that they're suing, right? But if the school were to call tomorrow and say, you know, we've rethought it because you're suing and your child could come back, do we really want our kids to go to school in places where people are this ignorant? Uh, it's a question that I can't answer for you. I know for myself, when this happened to us, it was the YMCA. The YMCA. <laughs> And I'm still not over it. I'm still not over it. How many years ago was it? It was close to 10 years ago. And I'm still not over it. My feelings are still hurt. And I know that the YMCA has fixed it. I know that they are letting kids in who have autism now. And I know that they're being kind and that they've learned from it. And I'm glad. I'm really, really glad. But I'm still not over it. Working on it. It comes under the heading of what's getting in your way. I need to put that down, right? I need to. Uh, I'll work on that. Okay, another great story. Speaking of people who won't put it down and won't let it go in a good way and what's getting in your way and how do you get around it. I love this story about the grizzly moms in Nebraska who didn't give up and who aren't giving up. Really, really remarkable. Uh, lovely, lovely article. We need to say, too, that Nebraska ranks 41st in the nation for delivery of disability services, and that comes directly from the AAP. Uh, and little has changed over the past 20 years, with one notable exceptions, exception, the parents. Uh, in this article, it says more specifically, the mothers. Women who are no longer content to politely sit back and wait for insurance companies to change their tune uh, and for Nebraska legislators to write laws guaranteeing their children receive the only treatment with proven long-term benefits applied behavior analysis otherwise known as ABA so these moms after years of patiently waiting as legislators promised uh, things and those promises remained unfilled and programs unfunded uh, and they were advised to forget about their kids and to find some way to unlove them Right? Uh, they stood their ground together and finally, finally, they got a win with LB 254, a new law. Uh, Senator Colby Coash of District 27 says, we called them the grizzly moms. I'm sure they're like getting t-shirts made uh, because that's a great thing. Uh, and these are the moms who sponsored the bills. He goes on to say there were a handful of times over the past couple of years. Uh, oh, he, uh, excuse me, Senator Colby Coash is the person who sponsored the bill. And he says there were a handful of times over the past couple of years and specifically this last year where I wanted to give up. Uh, but these moms would not give up, and if they could not give up, then I can't give up. There were nights that the legislature went on until midnight, and, uh, and there they were in the balcony cheering, praying, crying just being a presence. It was a real inspiration to me, and we couldn't have gotten it done without them. Uh, and we know that LB 254 is not a perfect bill, that it's just the beginning. Uh, Vicki Depanash, who is a mom of a 15-year-old, says, autism moms are not going to stop here. We're going to continue to work so that any child diagnosed in Nebraska can get this coverage. We are a force to be reckoned with. 
LB254 forces companies with large group insurance plans as well as state employers to pay for 25 hours of ABA per week as well as unlimited speech and occupational therapy with an autism diagnosis. So it's 25 hours. It's not that 30 to 40, but 25 with some speech and some OT, we're getting really close to that optimal window, right? Uh, technically, the law is in effect now. However, providers have two years to set reimbursement rates and organize administrative matters. The law will only help 18 to 20 percent of the estimated 5,900 Nebraska kids under the age of 22 with autism. It won't help those families with small group insurance or the cell or self-funded or those without insurance. And here's the thing that got me more than anything else. Most of the moms who fought so hard for the passage of LB 254 will not see any of the help for their own children. This summer, they will host a series of webinars for parents and providers explaining the new law. I tell you what, and when you ask me why I have yet to meet the autism parent that I, you know, I, I love all of them. There's not one that I don't like. This is why, you know, these moms got in the trenches and fought and fought really hard to pass this law, which isn't a perfect law, but you know what, if we wait for a perfect law, it's that behavioral momentum, right? We go right back to the jargon. Because if we don't pass the law that says 25 and then show progress, we're not gonna get these legislators to pass the one that says 40. We're just not going to. It's not gonna happen. Um, but I, I love that these women got in the trenches and stayed in the balcony and fought and fought and fought, even though it wasn't gonna benefit their kids, maybe because of age, maybe because they don't have the insurance policy. Um, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit tomorrow, I think. I. I've uh, been the subject of a couple of articles because talk about the self-insured. I have ended my silence on the fact that we, through this whole entire autism journey, my husband has been a long-term employee of Whole Foods Market, and um, Whole Foods does not cover anything for autism. Still, to this day, even though in California we have insurance reform, it's a self-funded plan, there is no coverage for anything having to do with autism. And, um, and I have loved a lot of things about Whole Foods and being a spouse of a team member at Whole Foods, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm not a fan of Whole Foods, but uh, I was quoted as saying, this is a black mark on their record. I think it's unconscionable of them, and I'm speaking out about it now. And um, somebody said to me, well, you know, what will it change if they start covering it for you? And very little for me. Um, very little for me, to be honest, because my son isn't in the place where he needs that intensive therapy right now. Now. But it would be remiss of me if I didn't speak out for everybody I know who's coming behind. If we, if, if today, if my son were two and a half and being diagnosed with autism, um, we would be in dire, dire straits because insurance is what is supposed to fund autism treatment in the state of California and we don't have it uh, because my husband's employer, Whole Foods Market, chooses not to. And it is their choice. I think it's a wrong choice, and I'm speaking out about that. I think it's remiss of them for a company who says we care so much about somebody's well-being. I think that that is remiss of them. It is my right to say that, and so I am. Um, because I need to for all those parents who just got the diagnosis, who work at Whole Foods and are doing a great job. I, I have the time and the energy to speak that, so I will. In any case, we, we move on, and uh, we're going to come back and talk about what's getting in your way <laughs> and, and what we need to do about it. So stick with us. Hi, Lee Sackerman back with your Talk of Facts, the autism journey questions and answers that you need to help your child make the progress they need. I'm here to talk to you about one really important item. A lot of people ask me the question, well, Lisa, I want to see this specialist in another state. How do I do that? You know, I don't, I don't own a jet. I don't have the ability to fly um, without great pain and travel. Not a problem. We know how to get this done. So I actually encourage families, even though in travel can be a tremendous hardship getting a child with autism through security, through the plane, and in the journey to where they need to go, we have a whole white paper on TACA about how to travel with special needs kids. So it can be done. So travel, we know that can be expensive. Not everyone has an unlimited supply of cash for air flights. 
We love and work with this group called MiracleFlights.org. They're fantastic. They will fly you and your child, so one parent, one adult, anywhere in the United States, one time a year. Also in the TACA document are places to stay. So often you will have people in your life that love and support your family and don't know exactly how to help. Ask them to gift you their travel or their rewards cards or coupons for hotel, rental car. That's a great way to be able to get maybe a hotel room that has a refrigerator or a microwave and that's close to a Whole Foods so you don't have that added cost of uh, going out to dinner especially if your kid has a lot of allergies. It's important to note that there's not a pediatrician or a specialist by every Starbucks uh, in the United States. Close does not always equal best. So I bring up the travel point so you know that travel is possible, number one, and often it's really going to help you get down the road faster for your kid and getting the answers you need from the specialist that knows what to do. So don't be afraid to travel. Welcome back to Autism Live. I asked you guys a question today as we do every day. I said, what's getting in your way? What keeps getting in your way? Because I want to talk about obstacles, right? And I love that you guys have written in and, and you're like no holds barred, telling the truth, calling it like it is. And because it's important in order for anything to change, we have to say what it is and we have to name it, right? We have to go, this is really what's in my way. And what we find is that it's like an excavation experiment, you know, where we're, we say, okay, well, you know, here's the first layer. This is what I see. And then as you take off more layers, you see more and more stuff until you get down to the nitty gritty, right? Um, but you guys have some real stuff going on. And let's talk about that first, that this is not just, oh, well, you know, change your mind and it all goes away. You've got some real stuff going on and you need some real help. Um, so I want to say that there's no poo pooing this. This is, this is, you know, um, the tough stuff. Um, but in order for things to change, we got to take it a little bit at a time and say, okay, so here's the obstacle that I have some ability to do. Um, and here's, here's how I can ask for help and here's how I can do support. Right. I, I really think though that mindset is important because if you feel like you have no choices and we have all felt this way at some point on this journey, right? Um, if you feel like you have no choices, it, it, you don't create behavior momentum, right? So there may be a lot of things that you don't have a choice about, right? That that's just cut and dried. Here it is. I don't have any choice about this, but this is where the serenity prayer comes in. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. There is all kinds of stuff that we cannot do anything about the courage to change the things I can. And it does take so much courage. And then of course, there's the wisdom to know the difference because I don't know about you, but I will spend a whole lot of time and energy on something. And then eventually I go, wait a second. I have no control over that. <laughs> Why am I spending time and energy uh, railing against that when I have no control over it. Two things that I always think about. Uh, somebody told me once the story of, you know how on your windowsill, starting this time of year, you know, you're opening the windows, the screens are there. And in the windowsill, there's always, you know, one dead fly uh, there. And, and why? Why is there always a dead fly right by the window screen? And it's because at some point the fly goes and they hit the screen because they can see the outdoors and they see it, but there's the screen in their way. So they keep hitting the screen because they're trying to get at it that way. And eventually they fall down and die when all they needed to do was turn around and go the other way. And you know, find a different opening, a different way, but they would not give up on that screen. And I hit my head against the screen a lot before I'll turn around. Um, but also, uh, you know, Tim Ferriss has a great book called the four hour work week, right? <laughs> Wouldn't we like a four hour work week? Wouldn't we all like a four hour work week? Um, but I think what's important, uh, the most important concept for me in reading the book, and, and he didn't invent this concept. There is an Italian economist who centuries ago invented this concept of the 80-20. And it, it's an interesting how many things it applies to. He was an economist, but he learned this, 80, the principle of the 80-20 in his garden. 
he was planting beans in his garden. And what he discovered was that out of, he would, he would plant all these seeds, right? And he would be busy tending all of them, but only 20% of them would come to fruition. And the other 80% uh, didn't actually bear any kind of fruit or vegetable. And he, wanted, he, he looked at the economy as well and said, you know, we spend all of our time on these things, but only 20% of that time is really effective. And when you look at the things that are effective, how much time do we spend on that? Usually it's a, it's a significantly smaller portion of time. In his example, he talks about sales, is that he was trying to sell things to people. And if he looked at most of his income came from 20% of his clients and they weren't taking 80% of his time, they were taking 20% of his time. And 80% of his time was taken up with people who really were like the piddly little jobs that needed a whole lot of babysitting and weren't buying a whole lot of stuff. So he started playing with the idea of what if I just took the 20% that was working and tried to replicate that so that it was 30% of what I was doing, how much more productive would I be? If I let go of 10% of the stuff that's nuisance, that really isn't benefiting me, how much more could I get done? And he discovered if he kept doing that and replicating what he was doing in the 20% that was working, that he didn't have to do as much work and his life was better. Well, I read that book when we were doing autism, and I have to say, I started filtering, filtering everything through that, and, and, you know, not in a perfect way at all, but saying to myself, okay, you know, what's working? And how about if I double down on what's working? And how about if I don't give as much time and energy to crap that's not working out? Uh, you know, obviously there's some things that need a little finesse and you wanna put some more, invest some more time, but if it doesn't show that it's paying off within a certain amount of time, put the energy into something that is paying off, right? Um, so from t I, I want us to all start thinking in terms of that, of like what's, if there's stuff that's getting in your way, there's another side of the question too of what's actually working and how much time and energy are you spending on the stuff that's actually working? Are you giving it what it needs? Uh, I saw very quickly for myself that I, you know, we were fighting with the school district and we were doing all these things and that was important, don't get me wrong, but we, we had started doing ABA and ABA was working and it was taking up a small portion of my time once we got it up and running. And when I decided, okay, let's double down on the ABA so that we make sure that because it's what's working, let's spend more time on that. And it really changed the it changed everything. I was going to say it changed the dialogue, but it changed so much more than that. It changed the way we were relating to our son. It changed the way we enjoyed our lives. Um, so ask yourself what, you know, what percentage of time am I spending on what? Now, having said that, let's get into some of these real things that you guys wrote in. Uh, somebody wrote in and said that what keeps getting in their way is the lack of support. I have nobody and I'm in the house every day with my son who is 19 tomorrow. He goes to an adult day program six days a month, but the, other than that, he is with me every day, all day. My husband and I can't go anywhere or do anything. My husband gets to go to work, but I'm at home every day. And then they wrote that strange, gets to go to work, LOL. I feel the lack of support gets in our way. I feel he gets aggressive because I can't handle him in public by myself. Just saying it would be nice for day programs to be free like public school. So uh, if you're watching, I want to know what state are you in? because there are states where you have other options, okay? And it may be that you've already exhausted all that because I, I think about here in California, for instance, uh, they have the Exceptional Minds program and they have, uh, just off the top of my head, uh, Joey Travolta's um, inclusion films, which would be an ideal thing for your child to participate in. And by the way, you know, um, he does those things in, uh, he does like mini camps in different places where you could try it out. And there is the possibility that your child could come to California. Um, and take place in one of these programs. The Exceptional Minds is a very extended program. It's a three-year program. Um, and the Inclusion Films is, I believe, a year program that they can come and do. 
So I, I know that probably sounds big and huge and far away. So let's do some behavior momentum on that about first saying, we have to get you some respite. There's just no two ways around it because what I hear is a mom who's saying, hey, I can't do this forever. And nobody could, it's not just you, nobody could do that. And you get to have a life. This, you know, your child needs a great deal of support. That doesn't mean that you don't get to have a life. And you even say, I love a parent's instincts. You even say here that I feel like he gets aggressive because I can't handle him in public by myself. So he's wanting more and you're wanting more, but there's the obstacle. So how do we overcome this? And I, I would ask again, which state are you in? Because in some states they provide respite free of charge to you. Other states, there is a small cost to you. Um, but there are other places that are volunteers. We have, um, heard several stories of places where soror sororities and fraternities will adopt a family or a cause, and sometimes it's the cause of autism, to be of support. Um, our intern on our show right now is from a sorority where they have adopted the cause of autism, and some of them intern for Autism Speaks. We have our intern here. Card has an intern from that sorority. They work with different kids, and that is part of their mission. It's part of their charter on their campus. So I want to know, do you live near a college? Is it a thing where you can put out a thing? Do you belong to a church or is there a church that you wouldn't mind having? You know, it's a personal question, but you know, is there a church that's close to you that you wouldn't be opposed to having them come in and give you a break? The very first person that I that in my life that I was good friends with that had a child that was diagnosed with autism. Uh, what an amazing person she is. And it was when we were fresh out of college, it was her second child and her child was diagnosed with autism and she didn't have the benefit of an ABA provider that, because this was many years ago, he's, he's 20 now, it's about the same age as your child. And she was able to find volunteers that were not with a sorority, not with a fraternity, not with a church, but just in her community. She put out a call and, and, and got the right person on the phone who said, you know, we want to be able to help you. So you, you have to be willing to put it out there, but you need some help. You absolutely need some help. And I, I know that there are some people who would feel really good about helping you. It's just a matter of being able to meet up with them and having it be safe, right? Um, for you and for your child. But I'm so proud of you that you wrote this. Um, it, you know, cause sometimes you say your truth and it feels a little naked, but I hope that you'll write back, tell us where you are so that we can work on trying to get you some support. That's what you need. You need respite first and foremost. And then once you get respite, then we need to talk about what are we going to, what kind of a program are we going to get your 19 year old in that's fulfilling for him so that he doesn't need to aggress and get you the respite so that you're better able to handle him when it's just you and support so that it doesn't always have to be you. Right. Uh, I'm, we're going to take a short break and then I'm going to continue to uh, come back and do some of these before we go to the A word. Um, but I, there are many things here and there's another parent here who's talking about lack of support too. And I also, speaking of behavioral momentum, in the interim while you're working on these things, you need to have a support group where you can say these things. Even if you two moms want to friend each other and be able to say, yeah, I feel that way too. So you do not feel like you're in this alone. Uh, right? So we're going to take a break. We're going to come back and then I'm going to cover some more of these, uh, well before we go to the A word. So stick with us. What is autism? 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 Uh, <laughs> I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, about that one. <laughs> trying to uh, just um, Jeez, let me think. 
Oh man, that's a great one. Yes. Uh, autism. Uh, uh. Autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability, and it's really not. I look at it as like a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another, it's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given so much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. It's always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that, that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's, That's right. right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're looking at your answers to the question of the day, which was what's getting in your way. And I, I, I love that you guys have been honest. Um, another person who wrote it in said, indifference from neurotypicals, not willing to give me a chance to do certain kinds of work. And I, I just want to say I'm sorry. Um, because as we talked about in the story earlier about the preschool who's not going to give the two-year-old a chance, I don't think it's your imagination. I think that there are people who don't get it, don't want to get it, are comfortable in what they're doing, and they are not giving people a chance. I. I want to encourage you to not give up. There are more and more people who are seeing the light and starting to get it. We know that federal contractors now have a quota of how many people that they need to be able to hire who are uh, considered having a disability. So that will help some, right? And then when they see how rewarding that is, they will help more. There are more and more people who are looking for ways to connect you with jobs. Um, and I would also encourage you, again with the behavioral momentum, is that maybe offer to intern for someone. One of the best pieces of advice that I got recently from somebody, and I wish I could think who it was who, who gave us the advice, who said, you know, it's so important that we ramp our kids up to being able to work by starting with you know, just the ground floor up model, which is first having some sort of a job that they do themselves, like the old fashioned paper route, whether it's doing the lemonade stand, right? But then volunteering is a very important of gaining a way of gaining job skills, doing internships, which is sort of, you know, the advanced step of volunteering because it involves more responsibility, which we hope morphs into jobs. That's true in the typical world. The typical world understands that model right so I want to encourage you to see where you at, at whatever age and, and whatever ability that you're at where can you jump in there because we can all jump in and volunteer we can all uh, put ourselves out there and say that we're willing to do a, a paid or an unpaid internship right for a period of time it is a way of letting people see how very capable you are and there is no harm in that we don't say I mean if somebody is 99 years old and they want to volunteer we we don't say oh you know volunteering is for young people it, it isn't um, so I I hope uh, and there's lots of different ways to volunteer right there's lots of people who have websites there's people who need social marketers um, so it isn't a thing where you have to have to actually even physically go any place anymore what are you interested in what kind of work do you want to do and is there a way that you can for a short period of time be able to do that as a volunteer um, and let me know what you think about that another person who wrote that what's getting in their way is not enough time and that's true for all of us isn't it there's never enough time to do all the things that you want to do I remind myself that Mother Teresa had the exact number of hours that we all did but she apparently had a time machine I don't know right none of us have enough time uh, another parent who said trying to communicate with my two-year-old who does not speak and I hope that you're watching our shows where we talk about using assistive technology uh, giving kids functional communication sometimes is the key to getting them first that functional communication but then 
moving into something where there's vocal communication. So I, I hope that you're trying out some apps and making it really rewarding because there's, you know, at two, uh, I think it's very familiar to people. That's why we, they call it the terrible twos because they don't have the communication and they act out. The, the thing is with our kids on the autism spectrum is that if we don't give them functional communication and we have to work hard to make sure that that happens, those behaviors will continue. Their frustration will mount and our frustration will mount. So I hope that you're making functional communication your, your massive, uh, you know, all consuming goal right now and using technology to make that happen because two year olds love tablets and being able to push buttons on tablets and having cause and effect. Um, and if it, if you pair that with being able to communicate what they want, oh, it's so powerful. So, so powerful. Okay. And then, as I mentioned, we had another parent who wrote it and said, lack of support. I have no one who can handle my son or my son slash daughter together. So I'm on the job 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I have no vacation days or sick days. I have no one. My other block is finances. As a single mother, I struggle. Gas at $3.79 a gallon while having appointments five days a week for my son. Now my daughter is showing signs of delay and will be getting appointments too, then my appointments, and they reveal that they just had a tumor removed. I'm lucky to stay afloat financially at all. I've needed car repairs for two months now, just can't come up with the cash flow. And God forbid I ever ask anyone for help, you'd think I was asking for a kidney. Well, and you know, there's asking for help and there's asking the right people for help, right? And sometimes uh, people don't have it to give. They don't get it. They don't understand. But you know, knowing who to ask is part of the battle, right? We talked about before about, you know, figuring out what, uh, what's in your control and what isn't in, in your control. You know, the price of gas probably is not in your control, right? But who you ask for help is. I want to encourage you to ask for a grant from Autism Care and Treatment today um, for the things that you need. That's what it's there for, act-today.org. Um, and they will listen to your requests. Uh, also want to know if there's somebody else. I, again, I want to go Go back to which state are you in because you need to get some respite you need to have a break from time to time you need to get some support for your other daughter but we need to get you some rest first so it's got to be about respite i hope that you'll talk to the other mom who's in a similar boat to you nobody's in the same boat right but she's in a similar boat but let's work on getting finding out how we get you respite whether it's from the state or whether it's from an organization that donates its time but let's work on getting you some respite let let me know where you are. I need to know where you ladies are. All right, we're going to take a break and go to the A word now. This is an ongoing documentary being made by the Center for Autism following a little boy who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. And we're seeing what it's like when he has the benefit of the very best of therapy. This is what we're fighting for, for all of our kids, exactly what's happening in Jack Riley's home. So take a look. This is the A word. <laughs> what? You're watching. Are you watching me? What's this? No. What's this? What are these? What are these, Jack? Eyes. What is this? Are you looking? Jack, really what's this? What is it? No. Yeah? Suzanne, we actually have three new programs in his logbook. They are um, action, quality parts, and action, quality parts, and categories. I noticed there's a notebook with pictures of Ellie. Is that part of it? Oh, no, that's actually, it's something really cool. Did you want to see it? Sure. It's, um, it's something that his mom made, I think, before he started talking. So what it is, is it's just things that are in his environment that his, his mom cleverly made, which is really cool. It has, like like different foods that he eats, 
and I guess she did her own kind of, um, can you point to the dog, what does it say, kind of like her own kind of discrimination training, I guess, for him. Um, body parts. It's a really cute little book that she made. And he can label all them, huh? What are these? What are these? Feet. What are these? Right here. Totes. Very good. All right, Jack. So we're going to be doing actions. Um, we're matched on waving in a field of two with um, an unknown, just to see if he can discriminate between mm -hmm. the two. Give me waving. Good job. What is it? Waving. Waving. Very good. Good job, Jack Riley. Jessica points at the correct answer after Jack Riley motions to the incorrect picture to ensure he answers correctly. This is called errorless learning. The reason we do this is that the more opportunities he has to practice the right behavior and be rewarded, the quicker he will learn it and succeed. It's positive reinforcement. Think of it like this. If you were constantly being told what you were doing was wrong and weren't offered help, you'd become frustrated and give up. But if you were assisted, you'd keep trying and eventually succeed independently. Give me waving. Yay! What is it? Waving. Perfect! Very good! You get all your stickers. Then what do you get? Clothes. Perfect. Nice job. There you go. So the next one we're going to do is body part, and he is on a uh, mouth. So the SD is, what is it? And we point to the body part on his own body, and he has to be able to label it. And he's been saying nose with me, because I guess it's close proximity, but... <laughs> Let's see if you know it today, mister. What is it? Nose. Say mouth. Mouth. Good. What is it? Mouth. Very good. There you go. There's one sticker. Okay. Ready? Look at me. Good job. Okay. What is it? Say mouth. Good. What is it? Mouth. Nice job. Ready? One more sticker, okay? Okay. labels that we've been working on with him. He knows so many labels now. What's that? Say bear. What is it? What is it? What is this? What's this? What is this? New book. So we move into categories. We're having him um, give us the picture of the category and having him label it as um, whatever category pertains to, like the food. Give me food. I do, yeah. You say like one thing, but I don't know what it is. Where's the food? Good job. What is it? Food. Very good. Nice job. Give me food. Soup. Bullet. Food. Okay, give me food. <laughs> what is it? Jessica and Jack Riley are playing together so he can practice how to appropriately play with toys. Are you all done cars? Or you want more? All done. All done. Okay. Alright. That's okay. All done blocks. Okay. All done blocks too? Okay. Alright. Here Jack Riley. Let's go for a walk. Sit down. Okay. Ready to go?
go for a walk? Okay. Okay. Say, let's go. Let's go. Say, let's go, Suzanne. Let's go, Mr. Jen. Okay. She will okay. come with us. Coming. Say, come on, Mom. Come on, Bob. I'm coming. Last week during clinic, Cheryl and Mike brought up how outings have been difficult with Jack Riley not complying with stop or refusing to walk. Sabrina, their supervisor, suggested that they practice this skill with a therapist at least once a week until the problem behavior becomes better. You can practice this. Go off in the sure. brain. Okay, let's go. <laughs> So cute. Okay, so that was the A word, and you can watch this entire series on its very own YouTube channel. And if you're looking at this and it's the first time you've seen it, then you may want to go back and watch some of the earlier episodes because it's all too easy to look at that and go, well, look at him. He's so compliant and he's playing with her and he's sitting on the floor and he's responding. And if my child could do that, then I wouldn't need to have therapy, right? That's what I used to look at these kinds of things and go, you know, there's the kids sitting at the table and they point to the flashcard and say, what's that? And if my child could sit at the table and sit in the chair, you know, that'd be half the battle, right? but you need to watch how they got him to the point where he wanted to sit in the chair not just could sit in the chair but he wants to sit in the chair and they they did that through a lot of behavioral momentum a lot of building rapport making sure that the consequences for doing something were worthwhile so that he he wants to sit in the chair because he knows he's going to get a great paycheck and everybody's going to be smiling and that everything's going to be good they've gotten this train on the track does it ever come off the track Oh, yeah. And watch the series to see when he starts to have a tantrum or when things get a little rough. He'll go through a growth spurt and learn a whole lot of things. And then he wants more control. Like any, <laughs> any person who's breathing on this planet. You know, if we're growing, we want some benefits to come from that. And so he wants a little bit more control. And then they work on showing him how he gets that. And then they get the train back on the track and things work well. So a couple of things that I want to address from this. We've talked last week, we talked with Dr. Del Nadowski about the verbal operants and how we don't ever just want to teach the label for things, right? So many of you have written in and said that your teenagers are having trouble and struggling and they can label like champs, but where's the conversation? When are you going to get to be able to have the conversation with your child? And, and a lot of you have said, why, you know, the school just keeps wanting to do those flashcards, but what's missing and what's missing encourage your school to get the skills program so that they're doing the verbal operants because you see with this child who I think he's just turned three at this point or is about to turn three um, that what they've done is they've gone through all these labels hundreds and hundreds of labels for things so that he can look at it and go what is it it's a map right and he can say what it is and when they say touch the map that he can do it so he's got the expressive and the receptive of the label great but are we anywhere near done uh -uh. right so now they're starting to teach him categories of things so that he understands features and attributes and and classifications of things so he learned a bunch of he learned this is a car this is a bus this is an airplane uh you know this all these different things and now he's going to learn that they're vehicles and he learned what a banana is and what an orange is and what a grape is and now he's going to learn that those are fruits and he's going to learn that they're food right so that he's going to be able to eventually they're going to have a sandwich there and they're going to be able to say and, and a car and a brick and they're going to say which one is the food and he's going to be able to sort through all the things in his head and go it's a sandwich right i understand that it's a sandwich and a sandwich of these three things are food and then from there they're going to build into being working on those operants so that he has the conversation they're also building how long of a response he gives because she says to him at some point when he's done 
one and notice that she starts this with the reward he's worked for he wants the phone and she says what do you want and he says phone and she says i want and so he says i want phone he knows he's getting it so he's he's got all that behavior and momentum i know i'm gonna get it so he's gonna say i want the phone eventually she's gonna do that with the less preferred things but she starts with something that she knows he already wants and that's how she's gonna get that compliance and then you see they continue to work on compliance with the walking notice and go back and watch this on your own he he goes off down the hallway the first time and mom says stop 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 and he doesn't stop right and so then it's quiet for a second and she doesn't go through the whole you know that when we say stop you're supposed to stop right this is where I fall down because I want to discuss it discussing it doesn't help so there's a pause and they say come back and nobody goes, no, you didn't do it right. There's no recriminations, come back. So he runs back, he does it again, and he stops and they go, yay! And he likes it when they go, yay. Um, so really, really important that the no recriminations, uh, absolutely uh, important that we reward the good behavior and when the behavior that we don't want is there it's like you know the little uh thing that goes you know nothing happens right there's no fireworks right the the little launch went out yeah the match went out okay um i for for there are three of you who have written in now on the facebook uh about our question of the day and i've asked for you to tell me where you live but you don't have to post it on the facebook you can uh message us privately um on facebook or at our email address to let us know where you live because i'd like to uh try to see if we can find respite for those of you who need respite but i need to know where you are so that i can look into that and i don't mind doing that but i'm more than happy to do that okay we are going to take a break because we have our very special guest that's going to be with us talking about a film uh, that I think you guys are all going to be really interested in. So stick with us. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The skills assessment and curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas, such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four-step system. Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions. Or simply type in a keyword, find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step 3. Choose Activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally, an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step four, start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The skills language curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, 
syntax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and we have joining us via Skype uh, director Sam Fleischner. He is the director of a new film that's opening in New York City on Friday. It's called Stand Clear of the Closing Doors. It's an important film, a film that you're all going to want to see. So, Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So tell our viewers about Stand Clear of the Closing Doors and why they want to see it. Sure. So this is a movie that's a family drama. It's about an undocumented Mexican-American family living in, in the outskirts of New York City, and they've got a, a son on the spectrum who's in the eighth grade. And the story follows uh, this boy named Ricky as he ventures off one day alone into the subway and then his family dealing with his absence and searching for him. And I think it's an important movie for, you know, people in general to um, get a get a sense of what it's like to, to live with somebody who's on the spectrum and, and you know, this is a unique perspective of, of just one person on the, on the spectrum and my kind of take and, and a lot of just cinematic tricks of maybe playing with sense, sense the senses. And then obviously just the, the bigger issue of um, eloping and kids on the spectrum running away, which, you know, just it keeps on happening. And it keeps happening in New York and on the subways. And, um, you know, luckily there was a kid who just ran away last weekend and, and he, he was found yesterday. So that was a relief. But um, it's not always... Um, a happy ending. So, yeah. and I have to say, one of the things that I, one of the reasons why I think this is such an important film, um, Sam, both for uh, the autism community and for people outside the community, is that the way in which you tell the story. Um, you know, we have the very unique viewpoint of the mom and what she's going through in this process, which I think is so important for people to see. But you also get to see it from Ricky's point of view, and you very poignantly show us the world through his eyes and I think it's a view that people don't often get to see we all all the parents want to know what is it like for them and you really do a remarkable job of showing us what he's looking at what he's fixating at uh, fixating on and how he views things and why he's acting the way he does because of what he fixates on it's it's really quite an incredible job that you've done there thank you uh, so this film opens on Friday, um, but how how can people see it? Where can they see it? What's happening? So anyone in New York City can come to the theater called Cinema Village, which is down near Union Square, and it'll be there for at least a week. And then if that goes well, I think this opening weekend will will say a lot about how how much the movie will spread to other cities and movie theaters. But Regardless of the theatrical release, it will be available on iTunes and video on demand and, and all those other digital channels in the summer sometime. Okay, great. So stand clear of the closing doors. Yeah, and we've got a Facebook page, so it's, that's a good way to keep up on, you know, its availability. And um, there's ways for, for special screenings to happen as well through a new, a new program called Gather which our website has a has a link to. So if, if people are interested in bringing a, bringing the film to a place that otherwise might not get it, that, that is possible. So, okay, um, uh, we've got more questions for you, Sam, and our viewers can write in their questions now. We're going to take a short break, and I know I've got a lot of questions for this director because I got to see the film yesterday. Oh, we're gonna. We, I didn't realize we have a clip. We're gonna get to see a clip from the from the movie. Wonderful. So take a look. This is Stand Clear of the Closing Doors. I'm the most awesome shoe ever. My toe is my eyes and my heel is my butt because I'm a shoe. I'm a mouse that's going to run through this field of people walking and probably get stepped on. No, I'm just kidding. I'm a shoe. I ain't stupid. 
If anything, she's the one that's dumb. She's the one that's stupid. Um, he's 13 now. He can walk home by himself. No, Carla, no puede. Hey, look his mom, right? You see him? No, not today. I saw him a couple of days ago. Yes, my son is missing. Rockaway Beach. Anda sin sus medicinas. Se pone mucho peor cuando no las toma. People are worshiping the devil tonight. That's what Halloween is about. A train, A train, A train, A train, A train, infinity, 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 infinity. And there was the trailer from Stand Clear of the Closing Doors, which opens this Friday in New York City. And we have with us via Skype Sam Fleischner, who is the director of this film. First of all, Sam, it's a beautiful film. It is so visual. It, it's absolutely breathtaking how beautiful it is. Thank you. And uh, But I want to talk a little bit about this leading character, the character of Ricky, who is played by Jesus Sanchez Velez. And I understand that he is actually on the autism spectrum. Yeah, he is. And so tell us, what was, I'm, I'm sure that at some point there was a discussion about do you cast somebody who's actually on the spectrum or do you cast an actor? What was the process like deciding to cast this young man who's frankly brilliant in the film? Yeah, I was pretty determined from the beginning to work with a kid who was on the spectrum, but a lot of people uh, thought it was, it was too much of a risk and were really opposed to it. So through the casting process, we were looking at both kids on the spectrum and, and other kids who, who are trained as actors. But I don't know enough about autism myself to, to kind of tell a kid how to behave like they have autism. And I, and I feared that it, would, that it would somehow like ring untrue. And, you know, my interest in autism comes from uh, just kind of remarkable encounters with, with kids on the spectrum um, that have kind of occurred intermittently throughout my life. No one too close to me, no one like in my family or anything like that, but uh, the, the kids that I've met since I was a kid who are on the spectrum have um, really affected me in a, in a profound way. And, and, I, and I wanted to work with a kid. I wanted to collaborate with a kid on the spectrum because they so frequently have, have really unique raw talent. Um, so th that was the case with Jesus. We found him in um, Florida through through a blog, an Asperger's blog. So Jesus is a, is a great, um, a great kid, a great actor, and um, I think a really good kind of role model for a lot of people because he's he's made a tremendous amount of progress since he was younger. Um, he was he was really struggling um, when you know he was I forget maybe eight through twelve or probably were like it, it it was kind of seeming like he would never be able to live a self sufficient life and take care of himself and then you know slowly he's just kind of like made a lot of progress to the point where he's he's there's no question that he'll live and like a successful independent life um so i think that that's really an important example that he that he's he's kind of demonstrated um and so what i'm curious what were were there obstacles that you had to overcome how you've worked with other actors obviously before you had many other actors who weren't on the spectrum was there anything that you had to do different for jesus because he's on the spectrum yeah a lot of people him? ask that um I think, you know, working with anyone that age is, um, it's tricky and you need to learn, learn, learn your own systems of communicating and, and how to like give to get and, and like, you know, 
just just have that have that exchange but you know i everyone wonders though how 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 was it different working with him but you know at this point there isn't even really anything that i that i can think of that that was all that much different about him i mean he he's he's really focused and he was really into the movie so if anything i mean i I guess like while while we were working, sometimes I would have to get him to just pay attention to his job because he would get excited about, <laughs> um, you know, bigger story points and things that were my job. So I'd have to be like, you know, just focus on on uh, performing, and and that. But that was that was endearing and, and really cool. And I, I think he's he's genuinely become really interested in filmmaking. Um, but. The other thing while while making the film was was kind of undoing his his interpretation of the script because he had envisioned this character as being a very introverted, catatonic, kind of silent um, boy. But in real life, Jesus is is so talkative and, and interesting. So I wanted to incorporate more of the real Jesus into Ricky than I think he came intending to portray so um, that was definitely one of the one, one of the you know challenges of creating this this character okay so i want to talk about another character that arrives in this movie and my understanding is that it arrived rather unexpectedly was a storm and was it actually yeah. hurricane sandy yeah so when you started making this film there was no storm that was in the script is that correct right but it ended up being a leading character in the film. And for me, I got to say to you, I, I think it's brilliant, you know, that that you ended up including it in the way that it did, because for me as an autism mom, it mirrored what was happening in in both the storylines that you were featuring for the mom. It mirrored what was happening inside and and to some extent for him that things were were changing and changing at such a rapid rate um, and that it was becoming chaotic. I thought it was brilliant. I, I, I you yeah. know, Sandy was something that was difficult for everybody, but I, I think it was a gift to your film. Yeah, no, I think it was as well. And um, I'm glad that I figured out a way to incorporate it. I mean, I didn't, I think like thematically it worked really well, but it was um, really a practical decision because they're, they're, I mean, I couldn't really film in the neighborhood um, any of the other shots that I had planned to do, so. Because literally the neighborhood you were, you were shooting in had changed, correct? Yeah, right. And it's where I live as well. Um, it's where, where I'm sitting right now. Um, <laughs> So we're and we're talking about Rockaway Beach, yeah, uh, in New York. I, so I thought it was amazing, and it really, so much of the film, and I and I haven't seen any of your other films, but I want to now. Um, you really got a feel for New York. Anybody who's ever lived in New York, it it you feel like you're there. Um, you you are very good at visually capturing the diversity. Uh, that's there through Ricky's eyes um, is really a treat um, to yeah I'm originally from upstate New York and, and spent time living in the city and I felt like I was there for the afternoon uh, yeah. it's, well. it's kind of an homage to New York um, yeah. in, in so many different ways but I, I found myself wondering afterwards you have so many crowd scenes in the subways. Were you doing, did you shoot that all guerrilla? Are those extras? Because I can't believe they're extras. They were so intent on doing their New York thing. Yeah. Um, we we had quite a few extras. I mean, the, the scene of him walking up that ramp mm -hmm. where it's really a, a river of people, um, that was, yeah, that, those were, that was guerrilla style. Okay. Um, but it's it's a mix, you know. Of course, like the Halloween scene was probably the biggest crowd that we we actually created ourselves, where we took over a, a car and um, had everybody in costumes. Um, and and then the rest of the cast is also a mix. But but most people we we had set up for them to be there. 
Wow. Well, it's really a lovely film. want to encourage people to see it. If you're in the New York City area, we want you to go this Friday because you, you'd like for people to get out and see it early as opposed to later, right? Yeah, well, I mean, just as far as like the box office ratio of seats available to tickets sold, it's really important. Um, basically, just, you know, if, if those numbers are good, then, then it it means that the movie can bode well in other places. So, yeah, we're trying to encourage people to come out this weekend and, and support. And we'll be happy to keep you posted. And and if and I encourage all of you to go to face to their Facebook page, stand clear of the closing doors, like it so that you can keep track of if the movie is going to be somewhere near you. If you're not in New York City, if you have an organization that wants to do a screening of the film, Sam was saying that that might be something that's possible. So yeah, that's possible through the website, which okay. is standclearclosingdoors.com. And that's on our uh, it's on the screen right now, so that people can find that. Uh, but really Really, and I, we haven't even talked about the fact that um, one of the other reasons why this is an important film is that it's showing autism through the eyes of a family that is Latino and they are undocumented and that's a whole other realm of things because it's all too easy for people to watch this film and see what's happening and saying you know why don't they do this why don't they do that but it, it isn't available to them because they don't they don't want to call attention to themselves it's particularly poignant and something that i had not thought of before yeah uh i i, it's true. And I think in the in the latino community especially it's um it's a very stigmatized and taboo situation to have a, a child on the spectrum so you know I'd, I'd like to see i'd like to see that change and i'd love even to see just the even it, I'd lo I don't think it should be called the disorder. You know, I think like that's no good for for kids who do have autism, which is actually you know it's a special thing that that there's a lot of there's a lot of gifts in that. So I, I, I hope that instead of trying to cram kids on the spectrum into into a box and make them conform to you know the ways of normal people, like they should be. They should be supported in pursuing whatever they're interested in because they have they have great potential to, yeah. to offer a lot of things and um, so you know that's like a cultural thing that that I think Absolutely. we're we're ready to see shifts. Um, and let me ask you this, Sam, because you live in New York, and I, I found myself thinking while watching it because it's you know we've just gone through the Avante Equendo um, situation, which ended so tragically, and so many of the police were mobilized, and I and I hope that they were more educated, the New York City police, about autism through that process. And I found myself watching, and this, you were shooting this, as I understand it, a full year before Avante went missing. And I, I'm wondering, do you feel like things are different now in New York City with the response to a child that's missing? Or uh, do you get some sense of that? Yeah, definitely. That, there was such an incredible outreach for Avante. And, um... And I, I think, yeah, it's ri it's risen a lot of questions about how to deal with this issue of kids running away, and, and I'm glad there's new legislature that's going to um, make give give families the option of having like a tracking bracelet yeah. Yeah. on their on their child, and um, you know, I would, I just, I, I really don't want to see that happen again, and. It's frightening. I have, yeah. I have to tell you, as a parent, there were several parts of the movie that were really difficult for me to watch. And yeah. uh, I was afraid that I was going to hate you. <laughs> I thought, oh, I've got to interview him tomorrow. Uh, depending how this goes, I may hate him. Uh, yeah. um, but I have to say that, you know, you uh, you told the story in a way that I, I could access it, even though I, w I was on pins and needles from time to time. Yeah. But uh, again, we, we want to thank you for being with us and talking about this film and uh, a remarkable cast. Uh, the woman who plays the mom, uh, you know, I, my heart beat fast for her. Really, yeah, Andrea really incredible. Surprise. She's an incredible actor. Yeah, um, she, really she, quality she, work. I met, I met her on the street. I, I stopped her and her son because I thought that she was the character and it turned out that she was, she had come to 
the U.S. from from Mexico to be an actor seven years ago. Yeah, and she went she went to theater school and she's done a a, um, a lot of work on on the stage and then has done some short films. But this was her first feature film and and yeah, she's she's an incredible actor. So yeah, she's uh, somebody to watch. Really, yeah, really incredible, incredible work, uh, and the whole cast really, really remarkable. And as I said, beautifully, beautifully shot. So we encourage people to go stand clear of the closing doors. Sam, we thank you so much. Keep us posted and let us know what's happening, especially if uh, it ends up playing out here in Los Angeles, because that's where we're based. Oh, cool. Yeah, I really hope it will make its way out there. Absolutely. So. Well, but th thanks for having me on. And um, thank you. Yeah, take care. All right, you take care too. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, really incredible film, Stand Clear of the Closing Doors. Again, if you're in the New York City area, you can watch it opening this Friday. Uh, but do check out their website and their Facebook page so that you can stay uh, posted on what's happening with this film. We're going to take a break and be right back after these messages. Just, just go like this. Can you see me? Puts me down, Matthew. Okay. Hi, I'm Rebecca Ishida. Say hi, Ethan. Hi. My son was diagnosed with autism in November 2004. With Ethan, almost immediately, we noticed things that were troublesome that he just didn't sleep. He would vomit in the crib, there were a lot of sensory issues. And then you'd have like 20 of the trains lined up, and if you came in and took one train out, just yeah. meltdown completely. Ah! Guttural instinct is to think that there's nothing wrong. Who wants to look at their child and go, there's something wrong with that child? You don't. You always want to see the best in your child. Will my kid be able to go to school? Will he interact with his peers? Will he be able to have a healthy relationship? Will he get married? I really thought that autism was like a death sentence. A lot of hope was given to me through CARD. This was my third agency, and the best agency we had. And there was no way in the world I was going to give up CARD because of the gains I saw Ethan was having. Ah, you did it. And I remember when Doreen saw us for the evaluation, she says, but by the time he's six, he will be recovered. And that's yep. exactly what happened. I'll fix that. Welcome back to Autism Live. Uh, had, I, I wanted to talk just a little bit more, and we had some more people who were writing in on our Facebook page. Uh, I, I wanted to address some of the news things um, that uh, somebody wrote in and said that uh, suggesting to another parent you might want to look into a class called More Than Words by the Hannon program. The tools we learned there are amazing in helping us communicate with our son. That was written in for the mom who was saying that they're trying to communicate with the two-year-old. Uh, and another person who said, the lack of support from friends and family. My husband and I never get me time. Everyone is always busy with something or they can't handle both our three-year-old with autism and our 18-month-old. We can't get respite for our three-year-old, but then what about the, we, we can get, excuse me, respite for the three-year-old, but then what about the baby? No one understands what we were go what we are going through, and so we have neither physical support or emotional support. I want to tell you a little story about when I met Temple Grandin for the first time. We did an interview with her, and um, it was amazing, you know, and I had questions. You guys had written in questions, and I had them on cards, and I was going through and asking her the questions, and I was nervous, uh, you know, because I was meeting Temple Grandin, and, and Temple is all business when you first meet her, right? And then, you know, she kind of warms up to you after a little while, and I've noticed that every time that I've gotten a chance to meet with her, talk to Temple, you know, until she understands, like, who you are and what kinds of things you're going to ask, she's, you know, all business, but then, like most people, I think, like, if I went in some place and was going to interview you, I would be a little tightly wound up for a little while, and then you relax, right? So then we got all done with the interview. We turned the cameras off. We uh, we had some cows that we had her sign that we gave away on the show, and 
she wanted to know about my son. So the cameras were off and she started saying, okay, so tell me about your son and what are you doing with him? And she started writing me a list of things to do for him, which was great. It was like a prescription and I still have it. Someday I'm going to frame it. But um, then she said to me, can I ask you some questions about you? And I said, of course, ask me whatever you want. And she said, well, you know, my mother and I, you Stacia Cutler, who we've had on the show and who's amazing. Uh, my mother and I are, are, and my mother in particular is really concerned about the parents. And Temple told me the story and she told it again recently when we went to interview her, Nancy Allspot Jackson interviewed her this time. And, and I, I know it's something that's really important to her. The story of she and her mom went to speak at an event and they were asking parents about how they get downtime. And they were telling the story about one church that has uh, a night once a month where they allow parents and even parents with, with kids who are on the autism spe spectrum are allowed to bring their kids and they take care of them. And the parents are allowed to go on a date or do whatever they want to do. And that there was one set of parents that has more than one kid on the spectrum that they dropped their kids off and then they went to their car and stayed in the parking lot and put the seats back and turned on music and just laid there and listened to music. And both Temple and Eustacia said, this is the level of tired and overwhelmed that these people are, that that's what, when given the opportunity to do whatever they want, they lay in the car and listen to music. And it really struck a chord with her. So she said, so I'm asking parents, what do you do? How do you do this? And so she said to me, what do you and your husband do for downtime, for me time? And what do you do when you get some opportunity to go and do something without your son? And I looked at her and it was like, you could hear cricket, cricket, because I'm still working out how we do that still to this day, working out how we do that. And I said that to her and she said, okay, wait a second. And she's getting out paper and she's got a pen and she's diagramming the whole thing. And she says, what's really the problem? And I said, well, what's really the problem is when you, when you pare it all down, you know, both my husband and I have to work opposite shifts. So to make it work, uh, so we don't have a whole lot of nights that we're available to go do something together. That's problem number one, but you know, there still are some availabilities. We just have to be careful about when it, when it's available. But problem number two, which is the bigger problem is who do I have available that A, I can afford and B, that I know can handle it and will be willing to do it and will uphold. And my son is great now, right? But I still don't want somebody going in and doing things that aren't the ABA way because I don't want to pay for it first, you know, with cash and pay for it for week, two weeks afterward if I'm going to get behavior that I haven't seen in years. And that's hard for me to overcome. And she said, right, right. Yeah, no, I I could see where that would be a thing. You need somebody who's trained. And she was thinking this through and thinking this through. And I, and, and she said, so what have you tried and what hasn't worked and what has worked? When has it ever worked? And I said, well, you know, we've had family members, but they're not available now. And you know, it's hard on them and they're getting older. Da, 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 da. And so eventually she said to me, what would happen if you were to take another autism family? She said, you have friends and you belong to a support group. And I said, yeah, I have friends. And she said, and they have kids on the spectrum? Yes. And she said, what would happen if every once in a while you traded, you traded respite. So you, you know, you have somebody who gets it, who understands what it is that you're dealing with, right? It will be a really hard event for them to watch everybody, but they know what they're up against and you can have somebody else come and help them potentially. Right. But she was saying, if you can get the other mom to trade with you, then what you've done is, uh, and you're going to give them an opportunity, then you've eliminated the need for the money to pay them because you're trading respite, right? You have somebody who gets it and understands. You have somebody that you can trust and that the rule is, is that they will call you if they can't handle it. Can you do that? And I was like, you know, and I, and I remember leaning over and saying to her, I said, Temple, <laughs> you know, cause she was saying, cause you have to do this. You have to do this for your marriage. You have to do this for yourself. You have to, you know, all these different reasons. And I said, you're, you're giving me 
marriage advice temple. And she said, well, what? I'm a problem solver. This is what I do in my life. I solve problems. Why wouldn't I be able to solve this problem? It's just a measure of figuring out what the problem is and then coming up with a solution that hits all of the different things. So I offer that to you straight from Temple Grandin. Is there an autism parent that you can trade with? And, you know, and for this particular mom, when your kids are so different in terms of what they need, an 18-month-old and a three-year-old on the spectrum, right? That's a handful for you. Um, and, it, and it's going to be a handful for somebody else, and sometimes it's going to be daunting to them. You don't have to send them together. What about giving the three-year-old to someone who can handle that and giving, like the respite, and giving the 18-month-old to the friend who's down the street who always says, oh, I'd love to be able to help you, but I just can't handle it, right? You can't handle an 18-month-old? Come on, right? Split them up. Uh, it might be a good vacation for the three-year-old, and it might be a good vacation for the 18-month-old, and it surely would be a good vacation for you and your husband. We all need to find the answers to these riddles, and I keep looking for more answers, right? Because, you know, even even that suggestion from Temple can be hard. It, and we're not saying that it's easy, but at least it's something to get your head around. Um, but I, I, I encourage you to think about those things and maybe think about it the way Temple asked me, what are the problems? And I never really thought about it, that part of it was availability, part of it was the whole trust of, of who's going to do it. And it's expensive. It's expensive. By the time you pay somebody to be a babysitter and you're paying somebody who's qualified and you want to go to dinner and a movie, I can't afford it. I, you know, I, I, and I know people who, you know, that's it uh, for the year that they go to dinner and a movie. Uh, hard, 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 hard to do. But I, but we have to look at it and start to eliminate some of the things that aren't working. And if asking your friend who has neurotypical kids or your aunt or your sister to watch them and they're saying, no, if that's not getting it done, it's time to stop that and say, okay, what am I gonna do instead? If you have a family member who wants to do it, but they're afraid, but they really wanna do it, you can get them training. You can, first of all, you can have them come over and shadow you, right? You can do that and you can get them IBT training so that they get comfortable. But that family member is few and far between. The person who says, I wanna do it, but I'm afraid and has that level of honesty. If you've got somebody, get them the training because it'll be worthwhile. And it's surprising who the family members are who like really, there's somebody who wrote it and said, you know, I, my brother-in-law, I never thought that he would be the person in my family, never thought that he'd be the person, but he is the person who has stepped up. He's been there for us. He's supported us. He's learned what he needed to learn. And that and she was saying, you know, I just think so much of him now because he's the person who stepped up. It's fascinating. Who are the people who can handle it and who are the people who can't? It's hard not to take it personally, but remember, you get you got 20% that's working, 80% that's not. Focus on the 20% and kick some of the 80% out, at least some of it. All right. Uh, do we have time to take a break, Emily? I'm looking at the time. Okay, we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to come back to finish out the show. Stick with us. What do you think about ABA treatment? ABA is the one that's documented, but I think that's what I think is important for little kids, the intensity. If this kid's two, three, and four years old, he needs 20 or 30 hours a week of intensive early intervention, working one-to-one -one with an effective teacher. Mm -hmm. And an effective teacher knows kind of how just hard to push, because you've got to stretch these kids. Mm -hmm. If you don't stretch them somewhere, they don't advance. Mm -hmm. You push them on them too hard, they go into sensory shutdown. The worst thing you could do with an autistic two-year-old is to do nothing with them and just let them sit there rocking. And when I was very young at two and a half, ABA type things were used on me, but it wasn't called ABA in that day. You know, my teacher would hold up a cup and she'd speak slowly. You gotta speak slowly to these kids because there's auditory processing problems. She'd say cup, and then I'd say cup, and, and the teacher would praise me. You know, that's very similar to ABA. You know, ABA in its, um, you know, original form is a little kid's program. The whole idea is you're trying to get language jump-started. And I like the more flexible kinds of ABA. You've got different levels of kids. Mm -hmm. um, once, I mean, I had ABA type stuff when I was young, mm -hmm. but then after I pulled out of it, I didn't have to go through elaborate things of getting ready for school. I still have this habit now today. I lay my clothes out the night before that I'm going to wear, mm -hmm. so when I'm sleepy, I can just get them on. 
And then you have other individuals where they've got to do very structured, you know, uh, you know, breaking down the task analysis. This is where after you get out of the little kids and you get them talking, they kind of diverge into yeah. different levels of functioning. And a type of ABA program that'd be suitable for a very severe kid would not be something you'd want to do with a mild Asperger kid because you're going to bore them to death and make them hate school. Absolutely. Welcome back to Autism Live. I wanted to give you a quick preview of what's happening tomorrow and Thursday here on the show. Uh, first of all, I want to address that we had um, promised you that Dr. Travis Thompson would be with us today talking about the codes for insurance. And he is unable, unfortunately, to be with us today. But we will, we are rebooking him, and we will have him back again. And our, uh, we're, we're sending him uh, lots of love. But we will, <laughs> it's all good. We just, we're, we're going to have him on a different day. We just so uh, love and appreciate Dr. Thompson. He's remarkable. So um, tomorrow, we also do not have Dr. Doreen Grandpache. There's a lot going on right now, autism-wise. We'll talk about that in a second, but we don't have her tomorrow. So tomorrow, we are replaying the second half of the anxiety discussion that Dr. Grandpache did. This is the one where she gets into the nitty-gritty about what we do about anxiety. If you haven't seen part one yet, it's on the YouTube channel where she talks about, under the DSM-5, how uh, autism and anxiety are being diagnosed. And it's a really good refresher course if you want to know what, which, you know, what the symptoms are so that you know what you're looking at. But the second half is when she talks about how to treat anxiety. So uh, really important. That's going to be the first hour tomorrow. Then for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy, we've got two incredible, two, count them, two guests for you. Uh, Tammy the Swim Chick is going to be with us. She is an amazing teacher who works uh, with all kinds of kids, but has written a book about autism and swimming. You're, it's, you know, it's that time of year. Everybody's starting to either get back in the pool or look at it. We want to make sure that our kids are safe, that it's reinforcing this book. You won't believe it because it's all about swimming and autism, everything you could possibly need uh, to be able to effectively teach or give to a teacher so they can effectively teach. And she's going to be with us tomorrow during Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy talking a, a, about all these things and letting us have the information that we need so we can get to the good stuff in the pool, right? Then we also have Doug Marone, who's going to be with us. He is for from the Ride for Autism, talking about an important event that they've got coming up. Uh, so very fun. It's one of those events every year that I say that I want to go to, and it's always on a weekend that I am out of town, and I don't think I'm out of town this week, this year. So I'm, I'm thrilled that I may actually get to go to the Ride for Autism. Lots of uh, souped-up motorcycles and uh, all kinds of things uh, raising money for a very important cause, and, and some of that money goes to ACT today. So we're thrilled to have him tomorrow. Now, on Thursday, we will have with us Dr. Adele Nadowski and Dr. Jonathan Tarbox right before they leave, because because this is a very big week and weekend in the world of autism, especially if you're in Chicago. If you're in Chicago, you need to write me. We had hoped to, to get there this year and it's not going to happen. But uh, two of the biggest conferences of the year are held during the Memorial Day weekend. And this year they're in the same place. Usually they're in different places, but they're both in Chicago this year. So Autism One, which is starting even as we speak, and ABAI, ABA international both in chicago this weekend if you're there uh write and tell me i'd love to have somebody on the ground who's there we just couldn't go but we've got uh you know lots of people that are dr nadowski and dr tarbox and other people that we know uh and that we've interviewed on the show are going to be in both locations in both conferences uh one or the other and they're not uh typically nobody's at both conferences but um super duper important weekend we're, we're looking to get more information and if you're on the ground there and want to skype with us please let me know i'll get you included on the show on thursday all right we are uh getting close to out of time but i, I want to take just a second to talk about how we look at these obstacles in our lives and what we start to do about them as i mentioned at the top of the show start to identify what's getting in your way what's sucking your time what's sucking your energy what's sucking your hope and then run it through 
through the serenity prayer test of, is this something that I can change or is it not? And if it isn't something that I can change, that I don't actually have control over it for whatever reasons. And it may be that you say, I, I, I could have control over it if I left and moved to New Zealand, but I don't want to do that, right? And so then you have to get to acceptance on it and say, so this is something that's not going to change. So I'm going to make my peace with that. And where can I put my energy that it will count? Where, can, where do I have the ability to affect change today? What kind of energy can I put there? What is within my capability? We don't have the ability to tell our children not to have autism. We don't. We don't have the ability to say and, and don't have feelings about that. That just isn't going to happen, right? But we do have the ability to say, here's how I'm going to focus my energies. I'm going to spend my time today making sure that I do and fill in the blank. I, I hope that if you're a parent that you're having ABA or you're moving towards it. I think that's a lot of the answers to a lot of the problems. And and knowing how to get that funded. So is it a question you got to ask next? Is it, you know, that you don't have your tax papers so that you can't apply for the grant? What's getting in the way? I, I hear you say you feel like you're alone and I want to help you to work on that because I know you're not alone. Clearly you're not alone. Three of you wrote it and said, I feel like I have no support. And so you're not alone. There are others who are feeling this way too. And sometimes just having somebody else who says, yeah, I get that too. You go, okay, it's not just me. And I assure you it's not. I always say to you guys, let's hold hands, right? We can do this together. Si se puede. Okay. Uh, again, remember, you can be writing in questions for Dr. Grandpa Shea, but she will not be here live tomorrow. We have her back next week, which is a very good thing. Uh, and we look forward to getting your questions uh, for her for the following week. But don't miss this important Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy tomorrow, especially if you're planning on having your child swim. This is National Drowning Prevention Month. So we're especially thrilled to have Tammy, the swim chick, with us tomorrow. Compl completely out of time, but I want to tell you what a privilege it is to be on this journey with you sincerely from the bottom of my heart. Uh, I feel you guys with me every day and, and I, I so enjoy being here with you. Totally out of time, but please give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you as well too. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye for now.